Well, welcome to Basic Theology Part 1. I'm Father Eric Zollner. So we're going to start this online. Hopefully we'll be able to have some people here in a few weeks. Um, but this is a great way to kind of set up uh, a structure for how we understand Scripture. Um, we don't want to say that theology is unimportant. We just need our Bible because our theology helps us to understand the Bible. Because as we've seen, lots of people can make Scripture say lots of different things. And so we have to understand how we read it as Christians. And so that's what we're going to look at through um, our time in this course. But we're going to start really basic, and we're going to build off of each lecture. And so we're going to start with faith. And this is one of my favorite cartoons. You've got Lucy and Linus, and Lucy's looking out at the rain, and she says, boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? And Linus, and I've always loved Linus because he's a little theologian, he says, it will never do that again. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. So theology, in its essence, is the study of God. It comes from two words, theo, God, and ology, or study of. So theology is simply the study of God and who he is. And our primary source for studying theology is Holy Scripture. Through theology, we discover who God is, and perhaps more importantly, why God matters. And oftentimes, we talk about theology as a three-legged stool, and this is a stool with, where the legs are scripture, reason, and tradition. But it's important to understand what that means. It doesn't mean that all three are independent of each other and equally valid. Uh, it doesn't mean that if we see something in scripture and we see something else in tradition, we can say, well, we're going to go with tradition on this one. Rather, scripture is the source of our theology. And then reason and tradition are the tools of theology. So we use our reason, we use our tradition to understand scripture, but reason and tradition never supersede scripture. Now we always start the creed every Sunday in church by saying, I believe in God. So what does it mean to believe in God? Is this simply an intellectual assent to a particular set of facts, like saying, well, I believe in gravity? Or does it also involve some sort of personal commitment? William Temple once said, faith is not only the assent of our minds to doctrinal propositions, it is the commitment of our whole selves into the hands of a faithful creator and merciful redeemer. So what is faith? And we have to distinguish between the content of faith and the act of faith. So you have fides que creditor, the faith we believe. So this is an objective set of of belief. So when we say we believe this is who God is, this is how God behaves, um, those are our object, an objective set of beliefs. But then we have fides, que, fides qua creditor, the faith by which we believe. And this refers to a subjective act of trust or assent by which individual believers accept and appropriate the basic ideas of the Christian faith. So we can say, well, we believe all of these things about God, but we also have to say, why do those things matter? Why does it matter that God is a God of forgiveness? Why does it matter that God is a God of justice? It's one thing to simply believe those things. It's another thing to live our lives as though they're true. And one way I like to often distinguish these two is thinking about a parachute. So fides que creditor, this is understanding the mechanics of how a parachute works, understanding how 
it, the wind resistance causes you to fall more slowly. So you can believe all these things in your mind, how the ripcord on the parachute works, how the plane gets into the air. All of those things, those are objective, factual things that you can believe. But the fides qua creditor, that is the faith that allows you to jump out of the airplane. So you can understand everything about how a parachute works, but refuse to jump out of the plane. So there's faith that is belief, and then there is faith which is acting on that belief. Faith involves an attitude of informed trust in God. One of the things I love about our new baptismal service in the ACNA prayer book is that when we're doing the, the creed, the baptismal covenant, we don't just say, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? We say, do you believe and trust in God the Father? Do you believe and trust in Jesus his Son? Because faith ultimately involves trusting in God. But we have to ask ourselves, can God's existence be proved? Is this all just wishful thinking? Is, is faith blind faith? Well, the existence of God is something that reason cannot prove conclusively. Yet the fact that the existence of God lies beyond reason does not mean that the existence of God is contrary to reason. Certain excellent reasons may be put forward for suggesting that God exists. These do not, however, count as proofs in the sense of rigorous logical demonstrations or conclusive scientific experiments. Because faith is about trust in God rather than just accepting a bunch of facts related to the existence of God. Thomas Aquinas talked about pointers towards the existence of God. This is something that we often today refer to as general revelation. For Aquinas, he believed that the world mirrors God as its creator, and thus something of God's nature can be known from the creation. Specifically, it's the ordering of the world that is most convincing that is the most convincing evidence of God's existence and wisdom. A lot of you have probably heard me tell this story before, but for me, my real aha moment in high school actually came in high school biology class, and we were studying the digestive system. And I remember thinking about how incredibly complex and efficient that whole system was, and there were so many things going on, and everything was needed, and it all related to each other, and I remember looking at that thinking, there's no way this just happened. There's no way this is just random occurrence. It had to be designed. You've also got what's known as the movement, or the argument from movement and change. So for every motion, there is a cause, and each cause must also have a cause. And so if you work that back, you have to get to a point where there is a prime mover or something that originates the series. And so many people have proposed that God is this prime mover. So even uh, evolutionary science talks about the Big Bang as the beginning of the universe. Well, the deeper question when we're looking at that is, well, what caused the Big Bang? How did that happen? There has to be a cause. We also have what's known as the teleological argument. The fact that the world shows obvious traces of intelligent design. For me, going back to the digestive system, that's a teleological argument. Uh, William Paley famously uh, likened this to finding a watch in the woods. And you wouldn't find a watch in the woods, pick it up, and say, wow, this is amazing how how the leaves fell in just the right way and the rains came and washed water over it in just the right way and all of these things happened and this watch was the result. He says anyone who would say that would be crazy because we can look at a watch and we know 
that it was designed specifically for that reason and it was designed by someone. <clears throat> so another question we can ask now are, we, have, we don't necessarily have proofs, but we do have evidence that point towards God. Um, so are proofs of God's existence really of any use anyway? Pascal, when asked this question, actually had two major concerns. He said these proofs present an abstract philosophical God rather than the God of the Old and New Testaments. And these proofs assume that God was, pri was known primarily through reason, but for Pascal, belief in God comes through the heart. And thus the existence of God cannot be proved, but it also can't be disproved. The way I like to look at it is we can't ultimately prove the existence of God, but all of these things, these things that point towards God, are a good starting place. They can tell us that God does exist, um, but we can't know who that God is simply by looking at the world around us. Faith beyond reason is not contrary to reason. Pope John Paul II said that faith and reason are not mutually exclusive, but rather they can work together. He said the truth made known to us by revelation is neither the product nor the consummation of an argument dev devised by human reason. But at the same time, faith is not blind trust. It's not someone telling us something and then believing it unquestioningly. As I said, there's always evidence. There are always things that back it up. When we look at the biblical record, um, these aren't things that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. They're places that happen at a certain point in time and a certain location, and we see evidence of these things. Anglican theologian and scientist John Polkinghorne said, faith is not a question of shutting one's eyes, gritting one's teeth, and believing the impossible. It involves a leap, but a leap into the light rather than the dark. And one of the things when we talk about faith, we're talking about faith in the promises of God. Martin Luther believed that faith is fundamentally trust. And he used the word fiducia, which means confidence. For, for Luther, faith is not about trusting, or faith is about trusting a God who makes promises and whose promises may be relied upon. And there are three points here that I want to hit on. One is that faith has a personal rather than a purely historic historical reference. It's not enough to just believe that these things happen. It's about believing that they actually matter for us. So it's not just about believing that God brought the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. It's about believing that that matters. And not only did it matter for them, but it matters for us. Faith concerns trust in the promises of God. Faith is not merely believing that something is true. It is being prepared to act upon that belief and rely upon it. The foundation of one's faith matters more than its intensity. And then finally, faith unites the believer to Christ. Faith is not an assertion to an abstract set of doctrines, but rather it is the response of the whole person of the believer to God, which leads in turn to the real and personal presence of Christ in the believer. Now, we would probably be remiss in a discussion of faith if we didn't bring up the uh, problem of doubt. Um, because we have faith, because we believe, doesn't mean that doubt is completely absent from our lives. I think any Christian struggles with doubt. And one of the things that raises doubt in our hearts is the problem of suffering. 
we ask ourselves, if God is good, why is there suffering and pain in the world? How can the presence of evil or suffering be reconciled with the Christian affirmation of the goodness of the God who created the world? Now, there are a lot of people that ask this question. And there are a lot of people who have tried to answer this question from different angles. Um, so I'm not going to give like the one definitive answer here and say this is what all Anglicans must believe. But there are a lot of people who seek to understand this great mystery. It goes all the way back to Irenaeus. <clears throat> and Irenaeus believed that human nature is a potentiality. So it's something that emerges. And so spiritual maturing cannot happen without the experience of both good and evil. And I think if all of us look at our own lives, that bears itself out. Because when we look at what has caused us to grow as human beings, what's caused us to mature, it's usually not the really good fun stuff, but rather it's the really hard stuff. It's the difficult things that cause us to develop a deeper and stronger character. John Hick believed that human beings are created incomplete. To become what God intends, they need to participate in the world. Human beings were created to respond freely to God and the good. And so good and evil are thus necessary presences within the world in order that informed and meaningful human development may take place. Now, one of the things that I've often said uh, with my daughters, I love my daughters. No one can, could question that. And so because I love my daughters, should bad things be able to happen to them? Well, I could have just locked them in their rooms their entire lives, brought them food and um, maybe given them some DVDs so they have something to watch. And if I kept them safe, then nothing bad would happen to them. But is that love? Instead, I've, I've allowed them to live their lives, to make their choices, and some of those choices are very good. Sometimes those choices aren't so good, and they have to suffer those consequences. But I think if you asked either one of them if they would rather be fully protected or free to make their own choices, they'd want to make their own choices. And sometimes that comes with pain, and sometimes that comes with suffering. Alvin Plantinga, I think that's how you say his name, he proposes that free will is morally important. So if human beings were forced to only do good, it would actually be a denial of free will. So God must bring into being the best possible world, and thus God must create a world with free will. Now this means that God is not responsible if human beings choose to do evil. And then finally, Jürgen Moltmann. Um, he believes that the suffering of Christ on the cross is both the foundation and the criterion of an authentically Christian theology since suffer the suffering of Christ is the suffering of God. So the God who cannot suffer is deficient rather than perfect. The suffering of God is the direct consequence of the divine decision to suffer and the divine willingness to suffer. So Moltmann kind of comes at it from a, a different angle where he's saying there is suffering in the world, but it's a suffering that God enters into with us rather than something that God is separate from. Because God chooses to share the suffering of the world. And that's it for our discussion today. So let's close in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us with faith that we might not only believe in who you are, but we might trust in who you are, that we might build our lives upon that trust, that we might serve you and seek to do your will, both in this life and in the age to come. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.